So we're going to go on that side of this plant, then we're going to go on this side of this plant, and we're just feeding string with our free hand here and using our wand hand here to kind of point the string in the right direction. What's up Lazy Dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having a fantastic day. It's a beautiful 75 degree day here on the homestead. A great afternoon to be working in the garden. So today we're gonna heal some taters and we're gonna weave some maters. So here's our tater plot I showed you on that last garden tour video. And we need to pull some soil up to these plants today. Got a few skips in there, but we'll still have plenty of taters for us to eat. Had one row over there of Kennebec's from our own seed stock that didn't come up. But we got a pretty good stand of tater plants in here. So these first four rows are those varieties from Wood Prairie. So we've got Caribe right here, Huckleberry Gold right here, Baltic Rose right here, Kuka Gold right here. And then as far as our own varieties, we've got this Red Viking Red Norland mix in this row here. And over there, we've got some German butter balls that are just starting to come up. Now, this row of Caribe here appears to be farther along than any of the other varieties we planted, which is kind of expected because this is a very early maturing variety. Already starting to see some flowers on those, on those two plants. And there's another plant down there that has some flowers on it as well. Now, I've been growing taters for many years, and I've yet to understand the significance of the tater plants flowering. I can't find any correlation with flowering versus the eventual harvest. Some years our tater plants make flowers. Last year we didn't have any flowers and had a really good harvest. So I don't really know what the flowering means. They're just there. Now these taters were planted mid-February and we usually would have at least healed them once by now. But we had some variable sprouting times. Some of these plants that look a little bigger came up within a couple of weeks of planting these. Some of these other ones, like that little guy right there, took four to six weeks to come up. Not sure why the sprouting time was so variable. Not anything I've really ever seen before, but that's why we waited to heal these. We wanted to wait until all the plants got to a decent size. That way we weren't just healing one or two plants and still waiting on some others to sprout. Now for some of these early maturing varieties like the Caribe or what some people would call determinate potato varieties, some people say you don't need to heal those at all. That you just, you know, plant them in the ground, they're going to mature early enough that the healing is not going to give you any additional production. And they're probably right about the healing not really affecting production that much. But there's still several reasons for why we like to heal our taters. So number one, it's going to give us some nice in row weed suppression there. As we get weeds popping up between those plants, those potato plants are kind of tender and sometimes it's kind of hard to go in there and weed around those plants without cutting the plants. So the best solution is to just throw soil on top of those weeds and smother them out. Number two, it keeps our potatoes from greening. So as these plants start producing tubers, those tubers will kind of tend to come towards the soil surface a little bit. And if we get a really hard rain, it may expose some of those tubers to the sun, make them turn green. You don't really want to eat green taters. So if we put soil around those plants, we are less likely to have our taters exposed to the sun. They'll be protected underneath the soil there. The third reason has to do with fertilization. So we like to side dress our potatoes once they get up and going. We probably should have did that a couple weeks ago, but we're going to get to it today. And when you're side dressing stuff, that fertilizer works a lot better if you bury it. So we can sprinkle fertilizer alongside that row. And as we heal those taters, it will cover that fertilizer. And then the fourth reason we do it, it just looks good. It just looks better to have your tater rows mounded up don't really know why but it just does so when we're fertilizing taters we're going to try to go with a balanced fertilizer or as close to balanced as possible so today we're going to use some of this nature safe 855 we're going to put one of those scoops there alongside each row then we're going to take our nice heavy duty rogue hoe here and pull some soil of those plants the sun it shines it shines for you the grass is green the sky 
sky is blue And there you are Like you are You're feeling so natural Find your blue-eyed way My darling will guide you But you'll find it on your own all right, all right, all right. We got them healed. I didn't do those German butter balls over there because they're not quite tall enough yet. We'll get those in the next few weeks. Some of these rows where I had some spotty sprouting, I didn't heal the entire row, just where the bigger plants were. These two rows here are pretty much full down the entire row with a little bit of skip in that second row there. So we got those weeds suppressed. We got them side dressed and it just looks better now lately we've been having several people ask at what stage or what plant height should you heal your taters how often should you heal your taters and you can heal them as often as you like you can come out here and do it every few days if you want to i've found that usually once or twice is enough i usually like to wait till the plants get about six to eight inches tall in this case they're a little taller than that and then most times i'll do it twice in this case since the plants were a little taller i might not heal them again we'll just have to see once the plants get a little bit bigger i'll kind of scratch around the base of that plant there and see if my taters are close to being exposed if they are i might heal them again if they're not we might leave them alone and one more thing to note here although they didn't come up quite as well as we would have liked we have some really really healthy looking plants here nice and green which tells me that the fertilization is working well and also i'm not seeing any signs of insect or disease damage we haven't sprayed these a single time and that speaks volumes about growing that mustard cover crop in this area prior to planting the potatoes there this is our second year where we haven't had to spray our potatoes any it's not to say we won't have to spray them at some point this year but so far we haven't and they're looking good and growing that mustard, that natural biofumigation, just really, really helps with any soil-borne diseases. Seems to help with insects as well. And just makes for a nice, kind of carefree tater crop. All right, so that takes care of the taters. Now let's work on these maters. So several videos ago, we put our T-post in for our Florida weave. We also healed these determinant tomatoes, pulled some soil up to them. I showed you on that last garden tour video how these things are growing like crazy and we need to run our first line of string for the Florida weave. I did bring my map out here today so I can tell which varieties are which and while it's very early, probably too early to judge anything, the more vigorous growing varieties, the ones that look the best so far would be the Roadster right there and then these Rambler tomatoes right here we've never grown rambler before but they're looking really really good and we grew the roadster last year and they're performing as expected but before we weave those determinate tomatoes we need to take care of these three cherry tomato plants here these torangina cherry tomatoes we're going to put those in cages so let me go grab my stuff and we'll get those guys supported so these are the cages we like to use here these square cages and the nice thing about these is they're collapsible make for easy storage these are made by amish company i think up in pennsylvania ohio somewhere up there in amish country really heavy duty if you're watching on youtube i'll put a link below where you can grab some of these on amazon they aren't cheap but they will last you practically forever they're a lot more sturdier than those cone shaped cages you might find at a big box store i think these are around 56 inches tall or so by the time we shove them in the ground they're probably closer to 48 inches tall or so they'd work well for determinate tomatoes i've used them in the past if i have just kind of one off or two off determinate plants that are not in line with my florida weave they work well for that i've used them for indeterminates down here because the indeterminates are usually done in july anyway they will topple over the top a little bit but it's usually not a huge issue they should work really well for these torangina cherry tomato plants so we're just going to poke these in the ground here we want to make sure we don't hit our drip tape i kind of want to get in the center of this plant here so i might lean it up this way a little bit there we go and then i can just use my foot to kind of press on the corners here to get it all the way in the ground good 
and I've seen these cages here make it through tropical storms and all kind of bad weather. They are really, really sturdy once you get them down there in the ground. All right, so our cages are in there, and that's why I go with a three-foot spacing. If I'm using these cages here, those cages are kind of big, just gives plants a little more room, and they'll crawl out the sides of these things once they get up and growing pretty good. I did find a tiny little tomato on this one plant here. There is one there, and I can't wait to try this Torangina variety. It's supposed to not get as tall as Sun Gold does, which would be nice. Sun Gold tends to just grow all over the place and get really tall. Hopefully these are more compact like the description said. And I'll probably get me a little pine straw and put around the base of these plants. It is kind of hard to weed in there with that cage in place. So I'll put me some straw at the base there so I don't have to worry about weeding inside that cage. So now back to the weave here. So I told you on that video when we put these stakes in the ground that we like to use these five foot T-posts, drive them a foot in the ground so they're about four foot off the ground that's about as tall as these determinate tomato plants are going to get anyways i have found that i can get away with putting four plants between each set of posts no more than that or else this whole process or this whole trellis will start to sag on you you can do a post every plant every two plants every three plants just depending on how many plants how many posts you have but i wouldn't try to do more than four of these big heavy determinate plants between each set of posts. So to do the Florida weave, in addition to having the stakes in the ground, all you really need is a box of twine and it helps to have a weaving stick. Now this box of twine, I'll put a link to this below. We use this for a lot of different stuff. This is poly twine, it's not cotton. So it won't biodegrade. You gotta remove it at the end of the grow out, which is kind of a pain, but not really that big of a deal. We just, you know, pull it up, throw it away. But you get like a mile of twine or more in this box right here for 20 or so dollars. And it works really good on a lot of different things. We use it for peas, tomatoes, all kind of different things. I like the poly or the synthetic twine because it doesn't stretch. Cotton twine will stretch on you even though it's biodegradable. So that's why I go with the poly twine. And then as far as the weaving stick goes, you don't have to have this, but it sure makes things a lot easier. I've used a piece of pipe in the past. I made this little stick last year based on another YouTube video I saw. I took an old pair of loppers, cut off this piece of wood from one of the handles, put me a little eye hook in the end here, and this works pretty well. There are some improvements I could make to this and that I might make to it. I just haven't had time to tinker with it. So as it is, it's working good enough. So let me show you how we do it. So the nice thing about this carton of twine here is that it has a little belt loop attachment on there so you can wear it. You don't have to carry it around. It's just right on your side here. So I'm right-handed, so I want my weave wand in my right hand. I want my carton of twine on my left-handed side. If you were left-handed, you want weave wand left hand, carton on the right-hand side. So the first thing we need to do is run our twine here through this loop on our weave wand and then we're going to start down here our first line of weave is going to go pretty low and then we'll just add more as these plants grow so we'll put that one there just a few inches off the base of the soil we've got our weave wand here we're going to use this hand to keep the string tight and we're going to use our weave wand to kind of articulate the string around the plants so we're going to start right here and go on my side of this plant. We want to try to get this first line of string kind of right up there to the stem if we can. If not, it's not a huge deal. So we're going to go on that side of this plant. Then we're going to go on this side of this plant. And we're just feeding string with our free hand here and using our wand hand here to kind of point the string in the right direction. So we go on that side of this plant, back on this side of this plant. And then when we come to a post here, this is where we want to wrap the string around the post a couple times. Just like that, keeping everything nice and tight. And then we'll start back weaving. Go on this side of this plant, this side of this plant, this side of this plant, this side of this plant get to our post and this is why you don't want really tall posts because it's kind of hard 
to wrap around the post. But weaving around these plants, just like this. Then when we get to the end of the row here, we're gonna wrap around this post here a few times. And then we're gonna go back the other direction. But this time, we're gonna go on the other side of the plant. So we kind of sandwich the plant in between that twine there. We're doing the same thing we did before, just on the other side of the plant. Still gonna wrap around our posts here. And then we'll get back down to where we started. We just need to cut our twine here. And tie it off right here. Make sure it's nice and tight. Put one more knot in it. And there we go. And that's what it looks like when we're done. That's the Florida weave right there. So we have twine on each side of each plant there and then that twine kind of crosses sometimes it's hard to tell but it actually is crossing between each plant which keeps the plants from leaning too much from the left to the right now my wand was acting up on me and twisting up so when i did the second little shorter row right here i actually ditched the wand and just bent over and did it by hand and this side here looks a lot better and a lot cleaner than this over here, although this will work just as well. And so as these plants grow, we'll just add more lines of string each time we'll weave in and out of the plants down that way and back this way. And usually it only takes, I'd say, four or five lines of string. Sometimes we don't make it all the way to the top of this post. Once those plants get really, really tall, or I won't say really tall, but four foot tall or so they get really really bushy and they're kind of hard to weave because they're all kind of intertwined but the big thing is is keeping them supported at the base here these first few lines of string are really important that's what's going to help keep these things upright when they get loaded down with fruits so we're not completely caught up from being on vacation but we're getting there still got several more things we need to do this week to get caught up we got to get these indeterminate tomatoes behind me trellised. I think I'm going to change that up a little bit from the way I originally told you I was going to do it. So originally I was going to create kind of this big square clothesline of conduit and do a lower and lean technique. But I got to thinking maybe I'm not going to be able to keep these things pruned as much as I'm going to need to to do that technique. And so instead what I'm going to do, still do the conduit along the top. I'm going to prune them a little bit in the beginning, kind of single stem them. But once they get to the top of that conduit, we had a lot of viewers suggest just cut the top side of them and let them bush out from there. So I think we're going to try that this year. And then if that doesn't work that great, we may go to the lower end lean next year. So hopefully showing you how we do the Florida weave was helpful. And if you've never really dabbled with determinate tomatoes a whole lot, I would suggest just try them one year. Even if it's in a little raised bed, you can do... Um, you know four foot long eight foot long raised bed with a few determinate plants you can do the florida weave just like we did it here in the ground in your raised bed it's a great way to support them no matter the scale you're growing and if you have any additional reasons to add to our four of why you like to heal your taters please do share those in the comments below if you're watching on youtube make sure to check out our affiliate links below a lot of great companies we use in our gardens here at lazy dog farm don't forget to go check out our website, lazydogfarm.com, where you'll find a lot of the recommended products that we used in this video, recipes that we use from the harvest from our garden, Lazy Dog Farm merch, all kind of good stuff there. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to subscribe, hit that notification button, like, and share, and we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Old farewell. Mm -hmm. By the beauty of your life